thinking about this panel discussion um, and this morning, a comment that one of the change leaders mentioned in this uh, separate discussion was really articulating the difference between change makers and the qualities and mindsets for change makers and those that are really specific and unique to systems change leaders. And that really resonated with me. Um, all of you are systems change leaders. This is your daily life. This is your one of your many identities. This is the work that you are doing and leading across your campuses. Um, and we recognize how difficult that is in normal times um, and how exponentially difficult that has been in recent months. Um, uh, we also appreciate that systems change leadership manifests across different levels and is an evolutionary process. With that, Dustin, I might ask you if you would share this screen for us. Um, there is one slide I wanted to depict, which is really building off the, the research study you're going to hear about here in a second um, from McKinsey and Ashoka, that systems change leadership really manifests you're leading yourself you're leading others and you're leading across systems. And so at any one moment, uh, the way I had heard, heard a change leader talking about it earlier today, is you're zooming in and you're zooming out. You're zooming in and out multiple times a day as you are managing yourself or leading yourself as you're interacting with others and you're thinking about big questions about um, advancing equity and justice through the systems uh, of, of which you are a part. And so we appreciate that um, it is a difficult process and that it's ever changing and that it's a, a transformational process that keeps moving over time. Um, and we hope that this retreat, and that, that's good with a screen share, Dustin. Um, we hope that this retreat has been designed to kind of cultivate and help you think on those different levels and kind of culminating in this panel. We've looked at self through some of our rejuvenation activities where we've said um, we had grounding sessions, the coaching, uh, coaching session, change leader resiliency. We've then kind of looked at and explored the relationship of our identities individually and how they relate to the groups that we may be a part of or other groups and how that impacts how we show up as we are systems change leaders, especially in our, our quest for greater equity and justice. Um, we've also looked at collaborative practices and now we bring that full circle into this all encompassing topic of systems change leadership. So our intention with this session is to do a couple of things. One, to present some of the latest research, um, a conceptualization of some of the key mindsets and skill sets and developmental modes for systems change leaders from a study by Ashoka and McKinsey. Um, and then also bringing that to life. What does that look like um, on a campus right now um, in the context that we're living in? Um, and hopefully a couple of practical tips to take away. So that's what we're hoping to accomplish. I'm gonna super briefly introduce our panelists, but I'm gonna reserve the grander introduction for themselves in our first question here in a second. But just to set the scene, these beautiful women that you have on screen with me um, is uh, Anita Baggio, expert partner at McKinsey and Company. She is calling in from South America. So um, Anita, we have uh, some folks, I believe on the call, I think I saw from Chile. Um, uh, Anita calling in from Brazil. We also have Valeria Butmich, scholar in residence, the uh, Legatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship at MIT Sloan School of Management. And she's also a senior leader with Ashoka. And Pascal Charlot, Cam Kendall Campus President, Miami Day College, also a former change leader. So many of you recognize her from previous change leader retreats, including Sundance, where she led us through an amazing um, kind of interpersonal development exercise. And with that, I'm going to turn over now to the panelists, if I could. Um, I'm going to just start with a broad question, which is, um, or I should say specific to you guys, if each of you would introduce yourselves, um, very similar to our icebreaker for all the, the, the attendees. Tell us about your experience and your passions as it relates to systems change leadership. Um, for this, we want to kind of be a little more popcorn, so about two minute response each, if you would, so that we save time to kind of keep moving through the topics. Um, might I ask Valeria, would you go first? Uh, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. Um, my journey with system change started with uh, studying industrial engineering and industrial systems, production processes, and so on. Uh, and then uh, I choose to join a non-governmental organization working on appropriate technology. And as I was looking why uh, technology is done spread, the need to understand systems, local communities in relation to the technology, and basically 
a um, connect what for me in engineering was fundamental, the product, the object, with the actual practices and, and the transformation of uh, lives led me into a journey that later connected me with Ashoka, which was my home for uh, 17 years, and more recently here at the MIT researching on, on system change. And just one more sentence is that, you know, through that throughout that process, I started understanding systems from the cognitive perspective, from the content perspective. And today I'm more interested on, on the journey of system changers and the emergence of systems as opposed to cause and effect, predict uh, something, I mean, uh, basically how do we all work together to, to create a better world? Amazing, thank you so much, Valeria. Um, how about we move on to Anita? Sure. I love how you explained the roots, Valeria, and I'm thinking here, where did it all start, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in system thinking, like there's no one spot where it starts. But I think to share with you, probably actually it comes from, um, I'm half German, half Russian. I grew up in uh, Berlin on the other side of the wall. So until I was nine years old, um, I was on the, let's say, communist part, right? So what made me think now, Valeria, when you were sharing your story, because I really grew up in the mindset that it's not about the individual, it's all about the collective, right? Uh, so I do very much as part of my values, kind of, I, I take this with me in terms of, we have to look at the whole, nobody's better than the other, we're all kind of equal. So I, I do think I have this somehow in my way I see the world uh, today. Um, I am very passionate about making change happen. Maybe that little revolutionary piece, right? Going through the breaking the wall and so on <laughs> made that also happen to me. But I see things are, as things are possible, change is possible. So I was very lucky to meet amazing people in the path of my life, uh, being, for example, Peter Senge. Um, so I helped co-create the NGO of Society for Organizational Learning when I lived in Spain. I met another group of amazing people uh, that we co-created the Impact Hub, which is a space for social innovation uh, in, in Madrid, and uh, which I think now is one of the, the, the largest one actually in out of the 80 in, in the world. Um, and I have also joined, because I believe in the power of teams, I have joined back in 2005 McKinsey and discovered my passion for people topics there. because. Uh, I really see in a consultant work, we make change happen, but it's not about the PowerPoint. It's not about the document. It's about creating the change journey for the folks that are you know, working with us, right? Our client team members. And um, I was very fascinated and, and I'm still around after I think around 12 years now at McKinsey. I feel very fascinated about tracking, let's say the tough, most toughest problems that you know, our C-level executives have uh, helping to, you know, not uh, only look at, at companies, but also helping governments, helping uh, really think about how do we make change happen. So today I lead uh, as an associate partner, our culture and change service line for uh, Latin America. And part of that, just to finalize, uh, this year we have gone through a, a, revolu evolu a revolution ourselves at McKinsey, which was not started by myself. <laughs> but I'm part of it, uh, which is actually reflecting around our own purpose uh, with all the things, you know, being COVID, being the things that are happening in the world around injustice. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to be part of this kind of spreading the seed of purpose in every one of our colleagues. How do we live the purpose uh, uh, also while working at, at McKinsey? So um, that's a bit about me and Beautiful, thank you, Anita. From starting with kind of personal values um, early on roots to rounding it out to current um, company context. Pascal, if you would also. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be back with my tribe. I see lots of familiar faces. It feels like coming back home. Um, you know, when I, when I hear that question, it's, it's a little bit awkward to answer because as a woman of color who's a first generation American with Haitian immigrant parents, I've always lived on the margins of systems. Systems have not been my friend. And so I have a very deep and personal 
um, not necessarily hostile or antagonistic perspective, but certainly don't see systems as a gateway to my access to so many things and people who look like me and people I care very deeply about. And so that, that was my entry point. I grew up in New York in a community of people that I adored, but when I looked at what the world said about them, it wasn't the truth. It wasn't the people that I knew. And so that started my journey to try to create spaces and relationships and opportunities that would allow the best of people to emerge. Um, I felt very deeply that circumstances should not define people's realities, who they are should. And it has been my life's work to try to find the divine in people or to create opportunities for people to find that in and of themselves. Um, in this space, I've been, I was a change leader before handing the reins over to Sandra LaFleur, who's doing a killer job. Um, and we are very committed to building personal agency inside of a community college context where you have people who come from all walks of life trying to earn a degree for social mobility, personal development, and essentially the value that I hold most dear is accessing the democratic ideals of this country. You know, everyone has a right to the American dream. I still believe that very profoundly. And it resonates with the lawyer in me. It resonates with the person in me that believes in a higher power. And that's a big part of the work that I do and how I engage with systems. Um, ironically, now that I'm a campus president, I am part of the system. So I'm hoping to have an interesting conversation with you about what that looks like when you're bringing a change leader perspective to a system. Awesome, we can't, can't wait for that. I've been delighted in some of the conversations we've had recently, Pascal, and I know that folks are gonna be inspired by um, what you continually learn and lead um, on campus. As we set up some kind of conceptions before we get to research and practice, I just wanna kind of conceptualize what is the term systems change leadership mean to each of you and why is it so relevant? Why is it so important and present um, for you? I'm thinking, Anita, maybe specifically from, from your perspective, working across lots of different sectors, working from the vantage point, kind of maybe at a macro level at McKinsey, where you're seeing across the, a lot of different sectors and, and cultural contexts as well. Love to just hear kind of both your conception of, of systems change leadership and, and maybe the relevance of it in this moment. Thank you, Angie. Well, um, I, I, I would love to have a systems change definition as Craig shared with us all those definitions early on, right? I think, I think it's still a new term and, and probably everyone understands something uh, different, right? And, and lives it in a different way. But I think that's the beauty of it. I think we're in a moment of creating uh, this, this, this new era of system change, right? We're all part of this. Eh? So I don't have the perfect definition, but if I would think about uh, uh, the 2020 experience that we're all living, right? Um, I definitely see that systems change is, is we feel it in our, our, uh, our skin, right? So um, I can definitely see that the, for me, the systems change has been revealed, uh, revealed through the interconnectedness, right? We see that it's, yeah, even though you think as a company, you have your amazing value chain, right? Everything is, all, you know, fully in order. You have your clients set up. You have your uh, uh, the, 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 the sources, right, that, that uh, you re receive set up. And suddenly, you know, be it through COVID, be it through other you know, now economic crisis. Now we in Brazil, we're living a political crisis. It's, it completely shows you how you're, you're part of a system. Nobody is not part of the system. So I think this interconnectedness has been really truly revealed uh, uh, as part of, of the, you know, the 2020 experience that we have lived. And I obviously uh, it has hit many companies very hard, um, you know, be it on an economic side, you know, I, I think uh, we see uh, also in the US, right, the number of unemployment has been rising. So there's very many kind of, let's say, bad negatives uh, uh, effects on through the systems, through the interconnectedness, right? But I do hope that this becomes like a wake up moment, how we are all connected. So we really need to think about not just our own four walls of a company, but we do need to understand how we're influencing the entire uh, uh, system that we're touching upon, right? And I think uh, uh, another, uh, let's say, hope that I would like to bring to the discussion when we think about systems change is that actually the solutions that the world needs right now for the 
you know, size of the problems that we're facing, they need to be interconnected. So no single person, no single organization, institution can solve the problems that we're facing right now. So it's the moment to really understand that we're working in the system, understand what are our advantages, right? What are our strengths that we have in different people, institutions and so on, and make sure we actually know how to use them to use the best of it to bring the solutions uh, that our world is asking for, right? And perhaps just a, a final remark in terms of systems change, you know, as, as I see that right now we're in this moment of creation, right? I do see there is, a, let's say, a crisis also of our values, right? So I see many of our executives, uh, you know, thinking about how, how to make sure I make, you know, I sub, the company survives, but at the same time, I take care of our employees, right? How do we actually bring all of those paradigms, right? The things that we used to be combining very well, suddenly I have to think this or this, right? So there's a, I think there's a reflection in terms of when we think about the system change leadership, what are the values that are actually driving our decision making, right? Mm. What are the values that are behind that are helping us to make sure we actually put the system into the right direction? T totally agree. I'm going to, for the sake of time, move on to Pascal and just link those two. So Anita, with your point about kind of um, the interconnectedness of systems and the crisis of values, my guess is, Pascal, you might be feeling that in the sector of higher education. So can you kind of just share with us a little bit about how you conceive of systems change leadership and, um, and maybe the, like, the moment of relevance for you? I think that that's spot on. You know, we are, we are recognizing at the heart of all of this are people whether it's the students we serve or our staff and employees, and people are also grappling with this moment that's inviting us to be a bit more compassionate and also humble. You know, I, we are not entering these conversations with answers. I think we're all trying to figure it out together. So the sense of interconnectedness is also leveling the playing field in, in many respects. I will say one of the things that I've learned uh, over the last couple of months is how important your role is in the system and your understanding how to leverage that role. As a change leader, you have a significant amount of freedom. It doesn't feel that way at times, but there are things you can say and do because you've been given permission to use your imagination to address root causes and really challenging situations. Now that I no longer have that title, I'm very restricted in some of the things that I can do by virtue of my position. And so in my position, I've got to think of the institution in the long term, to some degree, that is my customer. And that vantage point is very different, but I can partner with my change leader who can advance some of the things that I think are important through a different lens. And I say that because all of you have other people like me on your team who are looking to you to help bring some solutions that we don't have permission to bring on our own. And so I invite you to use your, your, uh, your courage, your imagination, and also this network to help us move these institutions. So that would be the first thing I would say. The second thing is never, never waste a good crisis, right? And so we're in a moment in time where people are activated and they're motivated and, and producing in ways never seen before. We took an entire institution of eight campuses that serves over 100,000 students and moved it online in about three to four weeks. That would have never happened in any other scenario. And that energy and that momentum is hungry for leadership and direction. And so what we're trying to figure out is how to come up with mechanisms to operationalize some of that energy and keep the momentum going because we recognize there's nothing to go back to. The normal no longer exists. And so what we need are people activated for the long term so that we can be agile and adjust. You know, I read this really interesting book called Radical Dharma and it, it talks a lot about the fact that there are systems of oppression that we always want to fight. But whether or not that system changes, you have to change at a personal level. Because if you don't change, even if the system is dismantled, you've been so conditioned by the system, you will continue to operate in the old way. And so there's an element of this that's also about the kind of environments we create to help people move and move out of the past and let go of whatever their perception of reality is in order to be in this present moment 
and find their sense of place. I'll share one more thing and turn it back over to you, Angie. You know, when, when everything started to unfold, um, it was deeply confronting at a personal level. I just thought this was too big to even understand what kind of a difference I could make. And then I just got really angry. And in my anger, there were certain things I wanted to do. And so I went into work and I had a leadership call and I had my four or five action items. And I started out fire hosing people and they, they were in shock. They were not where I was. And what I had to learn based on my position, I was no, it was no longer about me. I needed to be there for my team and to create an environment for us to co-create something together. Because by myself, like Anita said, I would not be able to come up with a collective solution to move a campus that serves 20,000 people. And together, we've come up with something quite beautiful, which I'll share very quickly. Um, we're creating an intersectionality network where we're bringing our affinity group co-chairs together and using the UN development goals to help shape our work. That's not something that would have ever happened before just by virtue of where we live and the silos that are so deeply entrenched. But there was something I had to let go of in terms of the past and also my relationship to my team to allow all of us to create a new reality together. Beautiful. Inspiring, Ladies and gentlemen, that's why she got a standing ovation at the exchange in 2017. <laughs> 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 um, so I'd love to just, um, maybe built on that theme of co-creation. I kind of heard it both with Anita, like the idea of systems change leadership is an evolving definition um, that as we have such interconnected systems, there's co-creation. You've just built on that, Pascal. Um, Valeria, I, I suspect that's a, a passion area for you. I'd love, you have seen and observed, you've been a social entrepreneur, you've been a leader at Ashoka, you've been in a position to see the evolution of this space. I'd love, is there anything we're missing from this conception or anything that you want to kind of help us round out how we think of systems change leadership before we frame some of the research? I would like to offer two. One is that the awareness that, that system change it means different things to each one of us, depending on where we are. It may be that the person is like Pascal, a university leader, and uh, the system would be defined both in terms of the context and, and, and the journey where that Pascal herself is in. And the same would occur with a corporate leader, with a social uh, entrepreneur and, and and so on. And I think this is often overlooked because we, we start talking about system change and we assume that the definition is the same. So the second aspect that I, that I wanted to share is a bit of historical context, is that the first time that in the 20th century that the conversation about systems, other than economic systems, uh, emerged, it was uh, Verta Lamphy talking about biology and trying to understand the human body beyond the sum of organs and functions. Yeah. Uh, that later was taken by Donella Meadows to talk about environment, to uh, help us understand the limits of growth, help us understand where the leverage points of interventions can be, the larger system and so on. But somehow in between that, those sort of like 30, 40 years that we went through in the second part of the 20th century, we got stuck on cause and effect, on predictability of systems. And at the very point that has uh, both Anita and, and Pascal has mentioned, at the moment that we, are, that we are at right now, it's all about emergence. It's all about a whole that becomes bigger than the parts, sometimes in unpretty ways. Uh, and system change leadership now in the way that the, the concept is evolving, I think it's been much more grounded than ever before on the need to navigate emergence, both yourself and your teams and your partners, um, as opposed to cause and effect, here are my leverage points of intervention, these are the two or three things that I will do and definitely I will uh, make a better system, which is totally upside down. 
but it was the truth 50 years ago. Let's hope that in 50 years, you know, <laughs> the new generations would have a, a better interpretation of this. Beautiful. Thank you, Valeria. That really resonates, I think, um, how systems change leadership has been kind of more mechanical of a concept in the past and kind of something to be measured and like mapped and kind of, um, I think that we're having increasingly an understanding of uh, the psychosocial parts and the emotional parts and the kind of value base that is required and the kind of self-management that is required and the inner strength and leadership that's required. Um, so that resonates really strongly and I think it really resonates with this group here that are living and breathing this every day on their campuses. Um, I think that may be a good segue to Anita, if you would share just a little bit about the McKinsey Ashoka study, um, highlighting just a couple of the, the, the findings that you had, um, and maybe just touching on that briefly, because it seems like the majority of folks feel pretty strong on the competency part and probably want to hear more storytelling. And to the extent that, um, to maybe Christy's question, if you had a top of mind, no pressure, but a top of mind example of where you see some of the, the resonance from those qualities that you saw in the survey kind of coming to play in your work before we then explore what that looks like in the higher education context. Wonderful. Yeah, let me actually start before I jump to the survey uh, with an example in terms of in my work, right? So obviously, we it's all confidential, so we can't cite names. But for example, I think, uh, uh, you know, where we see the collaboration happening across uh, different sectors is especially in the health crisis, right? So you see companies donating, uh, you know, to do respiratory, so you see the government are analyzing what, where are they needed, and, you know, kind of we as consultants helping to make sure the things go to where they're most needed, right? So really collaborations for a common goal, uh, you know, in the health crisis is, is, is an example of, uh, of that. Um, and maybe about where that this this all come from right uh, so I was very lucky and honored and privileged to be able to I think it was two years now Valeria to do this research together I by the way uh, I am married to an Ashoka fellow so uh, we I was able to get to know another of his 109 peers I think that we have uh, surveyed and uh, several deep dive interviews that we have done um, it's been a true pleasure to, to learn a bit more of what are these systems changers, right, already doing. So uh, the goal of the research was how can we have many more of them? <laughs> how can we have many more systems change leaders in the world? So this is why we went and interviewed them and really tried to understand what's the essence, what are the cap capabilities, what competencies that these are shocker fellow systems changers have that we then need to replicate, be it in the you know, corporate world, be it in, 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 the, in the academic world, uh, political world, and so on. That was our intent to go into, to have a list of competencies. Um, and what was interesting is that actually when we started to interview, so we do have a list of competencies, so I'll show them in a minute to you, but actually there was some underlying beliefs that these Ashoka fellows had, uh, what we call the fundamental mindsets or like a world view, right? Uh, so this was something before thinking about really, you know, building the competence muscle, there's something around how the person sees the world. And we summarized, there are uh, obviously many, but actually the main ones that we saw across systems change leaders were the three here on the top. So those folks actually woke up in the morning and really believed every problem is solvable. You might say it's a bit naive, right? But this is the way they approached each problem. There is a solution, you know? And I'll share a little bit, obviously, you know, I have to look for more people and collaborate with others, but they actually believe there is a solution. So that brings the energy to actually start the action, right? There's a second belief that was across all of them to actually understand that everyone so we're not talking just leaders, we're talking of everyone in the society, right? Individuals, organizations can actually contribute to making positive change happen in society when they're empowered to do so. So yes, you have to create some, uh, uh, let's say infrastructure or, or some ways of collaboration, some ways of dialogue, right? Some invitations, but actually uh, uh, they really believe that everyone, so, uh, you know, from the intern to the CEO, from, you know, the students to the president of the university, right? Everyone actually has a contribution to make for society. 
so this there's a there's a beauty in that right if we think about really inclusion and, and, and diversity right and um, the other one that get maybe even more naive the way we read it here the third one uh, was that everyone is well intentioned it's the whole thing about if I want everyone to be you know if I see the potential in everyone I really believe that everyone is well intentioned you don't have enemies you start your action with system change that everybody must have some kind of goal the goal that they have right might lead them to some action that not not you know giving the right results in your view but the intention behind is a noble one so these three beliefs um were our let's say maybe biggest surprise right valeria in in, in our research uh, which really was coherent amongst all of those uh, systems changers those ashoka fellows that make you know big changes in, in all kinds of sectors um so that's the first one i wanted to to share with you and and you know especially thinking about the new generation right i know obviously you're much closer to them but we also have let's say the, the, the millennials and the generation X and Y and Z and, and so many others right now. Um, there's much more, I see much more of these beliefs coming in as a natural from actually from, from, the, from the newer generations. So uh, 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 there's something obviously, you know, you, you are there at the university to thrive and discover them, right? As, as Pascal was saying, how can we make sure that the person that has this jewel inside can actually reveal the jewel inside? But I do see, there's a, 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 this resonates much, much stronger with uh, the younger folks. And I, I call myself still as a millennial born in the 80s, uh, 1980s. So um, that's why they resonate also with me. So this is the first message I wanted to, to, to bring with you. And then uh, we went to look and tell, okay, so this, if these are the mindsets, what are the competencies that we actually need to build? And we saw them on those three levels that Angie actually uh, uh, mentioned before. So on the next page, you will see, right? There's a there's competencies that we see that the self, so the person itself as a uh, systems changer needs to have, right? Then the way it actually influences others, so leading others, there are some competencies that go through, you know, to help actually build system change. And at the end, obviously, there's something around leading the system itself, right? And we found these five competencies. One uh, is around making sure that you actually have a purpose, right? There's a bigger task at hand. Huh? There's a meaning to your work. Uh, and lots of the, the, the stories that we heard are actually system changes. They have some kind of experience in childhood or some kind of trauma or some kind of thing that they, they have a clash with their own, let's say, iceberg of values, of needs, uh, uh, of understanding. So there is where kind of the, the, the purpose arises, but they're able to build the purpose and align the purpose with others through empathy. So I'll share a little bit more in detail about that. But for me, that was a very, very special dimension, especially when you think about now the next generation of, of system change leaders. There's something around continuous change. I mean, this is probably you know very natural because system change doesn't happen overnight. You need to over and over and over nonstop, you know, it's, it's con there's no end point, right? There's continuous evolution. So you really need to be ready and have the resilience to embrace this change continuously. You mentioned before in your poll, that was the most voted one, right? Uh, courage to be different. So uh, uh, and I'll share a little bit more detail since you asked more about that one here in a, in a second. But there's really something around of systems changers actually being comfortable to be an outlier. Because to be able to provoke a system change is usually a bit like Pascal, you were mentioning in your story, right? You, you didn't feel part of the system, right? And that's okay. Because if you don't feel part of the system, you are the one creating your systems. So you're creating the new system change, right? So there's this courage of being okay with going against the flow of everyone else. The, the fourth one linked with the second one, a bias to action. So it's not about planning and, you know, it's about doing, constantly doing and feedback loops of how can I do better, right? But it's like first doing and then uh, then reflecting. Um, so here's an invitation. I know you know we're talking to a lot of university uh, uh, folks. You are making a lot of change happen already, right? So how can we spark this even more, right? Uh, first action and then then reflection. Uh, so I think this is a bit a, a paradigm shift that actually also the academic world needs to go through. 
And last but not least, uh, since you can't do anything alone, especially with the big problems that we're facing, it's about collaborating together for, for impact. So these were the five competencies that we distilled from our research, talking to uh, more than 109 uh, um, Ashoka fellows and system changes. And I wanted to double click, Justin, if you can go to the last page of this one, just to on the, on the one, on the two, uh, two uh, dimensions, one more. Do we have one more? Yeah. Uh, the two dimensions that I wanted to highlight. So look into the middle one here, which says courage to be different, which is the one you wanted in your poll more to learn about, right? So like I told you, it kind of, all of these five competencies, they are like, it's like an onion, right? The peel is an onion, go from self, to others and to systems. So when we discovered uh, the courage to be different, how does it actually manifest, right? So as I mentioned, as a self, as a system change leader, first of all, you need to be comfortable to be seen as an outlier. It's okay to be different, right? Then since you can't do it alone, you do need to organize in a team. And there obviously, you know, with the collaboration with Ashoka and, and having all the experience of so many years, right? It has to be an inclusive team. So everybody's heard, right? And non-hierarchical. As I, as I mentioned, so since we are really gathering system changes, many different stakeholders that are maybe not usually together in their everyday situations, right? You really need to have the space of a team where it's non-hierarchical and inclusive so that actually everybody can and may contribute. And then on the systems level, the courage to be different is to really think about it in a bigger way, right? So think about a problem as a systems failure. So look at it and what is going wrong in a bigger picture. So here's uh, one that I wanted to share with you. And I wanted, I know it was not voted a lot, but I wanted to uh, leave you with a note from what I have seen uh, so far in these last two, three months in the cultural transformations that I've been doing with uh, C-level executives across different sectors is actually the first one here, the first to build purpose through empathy. I do believe that actually the solution, the new kind of era that I would like the next normal, we're already living the new normal, <laughs> as I was saying, but the next normal, I would love to see having purpose and empathy be really at the core of our way of doing things, of our being and way of doing things uh, uh, across different sectors, right? And for that, our uh, uh, it starts with uh, the self um, view of really having the, the deep purpose that we saw in those uh, um, uh, Ashoka fellows. It was like a, a it really it was like a moral responsibility. I'm here on this earth to make this happen. So there was like a really strong identification with the change of leading by example, right? And, and that helped them to actually be resilient over time because it was really, nobody told them that this was their cause, right? It came from true beliefs, true values from within themselves. And then what you do is, you know, by leading by example from yourself, you are able to inspire others, right? And you inspire others, not by forcing them, but actually building trust and thinking about Win-win solutions. I think this is something different, right? Usually when we come together to solve a problem, so you think everybody thinks about what's my benefit in here, right? And that's good. That's fine. So how do we actually make sure that we understand the win-win? So what are the benefits for all of us? So it's not one working against the other, but really understanding what are the win-win solutions. And maybe each of you has a different benefit getting out of it. But we actually, at the end, we're looking towards common ground. So ability of a system changer to bring this variety variety of stakeholders and make them understand that we actually have a common ground and i think for example the example i gave before on the respirators right the health crisis is a common ground right so then we're all in this together and building this so we need to continuously on all the difficulties that we're facing on earth making sure that we actually understand what are the common ground solutions that we have right? and like i mentioned before uh, I think when you think about purpose and building this empathy, it's really engaging people in a, in a broad vision. I do think now is the moment of creating what's what's our 2030 vision with the experience from 2020. What where are we going through? Since system change is happening over time, the system change are able to create this long-term vision 
right? And they're resilient. So every time they maybe fall down, it doesn't work and, you know, have to course correct, they still stay and go back on the path. But there's the need of really creating this long-term vision. And I really look also for universities, for the change agents that you're creating. We need to build not this, the, the, you know, the December 2020 solution. We need to create now what is the science fiction, what is the, the real fiction that we're creating for, for the world we want to live in. So um, anyway, just to zoom on in these two, one, because of you, what you asked for, and two, because I really believe empathy and purpose should be part of our, our, our next uh, normal. And if I can finalize, we can go dust into the third page, um, this one here. So we also asked in our research, the Shaka Fellows, of how were you able to build systems change leadership, right? So if we want to replicate and scale it, what are the ways we can actually scale it? And what I think is interesting in terms of, uh, um, you know, thinking about university and the, the, the space of learning that you are all creating, look at the list of, of ways of creating system change leadership that we heard from our interviewers, right? One is hands-on life experience. So really trial and error, getting a team together, bias to action, making things happen, learning from it, right? Experiencing the quick wins that come through that. Experiential learning, again, uh, uh, here it was more linked to actually building up, maybe connecting with Ashoka fellows who are on, uh, NGOs that are working on things, right? And, and experiencing things on the field. Peer-to-peer -peer changes. So things that you were doing now these days, right? Learning from each other uh, of what does it actually mean in action. Exposure to role models. So who are the ones, who are the system changers? And again, you're part of this amazing network through a shock university and you have amazing uh, role models at your fingertips. So use them even more, right? Use them as mentors, use them as coaches, um, use them as, as, as role models to you that can maybe help you in, in your paths and, your, and, your, and, and the ideas that you might be having that are boiling in your head, but you don't know how to happen, right? And on the job coaching and mentoring. So once you actually do system change all the time, have somebody to, as a mirror to share, hey, why didn't you do that? How, or, you know, how can we do that better? So here's a bit of a provocation to you all. Um, I think the face-to-face -face kind of learning module was like I think top, maybe in one of these here, top four, top five of the options, but it was not the top three, right? So here's really something around how, how can we as, as, as universities, as the academic world, reinvent ourselves to really truly incorporate experiential learning so that actually system change is not something that happens on paper, but actually happens on reality and changes people's lives through their own experiences with it. And with that, let me close here. I'm sure many more questions than answers that are in your, in your head, but we do have the article you can read more and obviously we have more time. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Anita. And we've shared that article link in the chat. And I don't know if you've been able to see the chat coming in, people really interested in that framework. So it's clearly resonant. Danica wants to put it on the back of her wall and just have it as kind of like wallpaper or a screen. Um, so I think there's a lot of resonance there. I'd love to now bring that to life and really set that in the context of lived experience. Um, and so Valeria, I want to turn to you. Um, if you can give kind of a brief vignette or two from um, Ashoka Fellows or other kind of experiences where you've seen this come to life and maybe digging into those areas of interest of like the courage to be different around seeing a systems failure, around seeing um, oneself and feeling comfortable stepping into that space as a disruptor um, and around the, the kind of team of teams of like bringing this emergence together. So I'd love to hear you briefly speak about that. We're also going to then turn to Pascal to bring it to life in a higher education context. So you're on the hot seat next, Pascal. Um, and if we have time, we're going to get to some practical tips at the end. Yeah, and you would like this in two minutes, correct? No, no, no. About five to six minutes. Does that okay. work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Let me share three examples uh, that built uh, from what Anita uh, has been sharing. And, and the first one is the, the connection to, to purpose. Um, yeah, and the, the Ashoka fellow that comes to mind is, uh, she's from Canada, Nicole Rycroft. Today she leads um, an organization, Canopy, that it has transformed the recycle paper recycling industry publishers in Canada have become green uh, thanks to the efforts and the vision of Nicole 
And when she started, she knew nothing about paper recycling. She knew, uh, what she knew what was that as an athlete, she loved nature and that she saw an opportunity to transform the way we use paper in a way that it would be a, um, a, it not totally a circular economy, it would create, a, it would save basically millions of trees if Canadians would become interested in a, buying, preferring to buy books that, and paper, newspapers that were produced with recycled paper. Now, this idea that you are connected to your purpose and you see an opportunity that you may not know but how, but you will figure out who to build a team with, who to partner with, how to acquire the, the knowledge, fill the gaps, and develop the strategy that will manifest that vision in the world. It's, uh, I find that incredibly courageous and, and daring, and it has to be grounded in a profound sense of purpose, uh, something that you care deeply. And it doesn't matter if you are in a university, if you're in a corporation, the point is focus in what really drives you. Uh, and do your homework to the extent that whatever uh, drives you, to, you may not know exactly how. Don't be afraid of, of that. The other example is a uh, uh, Stephen friend. Uh, and Stephen, it's, uh, it's definitely the most hard, the hardest type of outlier because when when you are uh, for 20 years leading cancer research in a corporation like Merck and you decide that whatever the industry is doing needs to be turned upside down in terms of corporations uh, need to, if they sh if his vision was over 10 years ago inspired by the Genome Project and he basically said, what if we all get together and share our research protocols, our data, our findings. What would it happen? And what it would happen is that it would accelerate the emergence of new solutions for cancer, and it would save hundreds of millions of lives. Uh, but the way uh, the value creation process is structured in health, uh, I mean, in drug uh, companies, on the surface, it goes against that until he basically proved that it could be a win-win um, for all the actors. And he had to go have a bias for uh, um, action in the sense that people were not gonna suspend judgment. They would need proof that this was good for the bottom line of the company. And at the same time, that all the participating actors had something to contribute. Um, and for example, one of the, the things that he had to, there were multiple iterations of inventions. For example, one of the things that they had to be incredibly creative was on how they would share the, the ultimate value of the collaborative research that they were gonna embark on and how would they provide credit to all the researchers and, and, and so on. Um, and as person like um, Stephen, it's in, it's the ultimate courageous act in the sense that um, I'm offering him as the ultimate courageous act in the sense that he was leaving before, behind the safetyness of his job and he moved and the prestige of being at the top of his field to literally start an NGO with a concept and with an incredibly bold vision that many were kept against his industry, skeptic in his industry. And I asked him uh, when we were in the middle of the, the, a deep conversation on, on his journey, uh, I, I, he stopped him and I said, how did you do it? I mean, how did you actually build the core team that allowed you to go through the, each iteration? 
And his answer blew my mind. He said, you know, it's one person at a time. It's in the intimacy of sharing the same goal, the same purpose. And he also joked and said it was many one-on-one -on -one dinners and probably more bottles of wine that we should have drank. But the bottom line is that you have to meet the other in the eyes and share a purpose. And the, uh, the vision may evolve. The actual steps may be negotiated. But if you share the, the, the goal, there will be trust and you will truly become a team, even if you are in different departments, in different organizations and so on. In many respects, all of you here today are, are a team that is making possible the transformation of university. And the third example is um, the fact that most, I mean, it's related to the fact that as you try to realize your vision, you need new tools. You need new ways that move beyond uh, the hierarchical ways, that move beyond the cognitive driven kind of processes that open the space for, for innovation. And uh, Ashoka Fellows, there are, for example, more than 350, if, if close to probably 500 Ashoka fellows working on agricultural development, supporting the small farmers, transforming rural economies. And we see more and more in, in their uh, models that the essence of the model is to multiply change making. The essence of the model is to develop a tool that enable others to activate their own power. And that sometimes is workshops, that sometimes is contents. Uh, more often than not, is about changing mindsets about what is possible. And it's also the, um, the nitty gritty of how do you build a platform to marketing, uh, to market agricultural goods at a scale and so on. But it's fundamentally about activating people's power and finding ways um, to build that, that share intent uh, with many. Uh, and finally, the idea that it is, at the end, it's about processes, it's about tools. Once you have done the work of truly building, not just in yourself, but in everyone, the kind of leadership that will um, result in transformation of systems of self and of the teams themselves. Mm. Thank you, Valeria. Um, and I, I really appreciate that call for um, multiplying change makers. And I think that resonates with this, this group of folks. And I can't think of an institution trying to do that more prolifically than one of the largest institutions in um, the United States, which is Miami Dade College. Pascal, I'd love to just invite you into the conversation and help bring home to us those competencies in the context of, of your experience right here and now. Um, I, I think several of the points that, that Valeria was talking about of like focus, I think that that is probably called to challenge in a time of COVID, in a time of com complete ambiguity and evolution. So how does one keep that focus and how does one keep to the values while at the same time iterating overnight and having a bias to action and experimentation while having the courage to address some of the systemic racism that we, we have in our institutions. And so um, you're not going to answer all of that for us in the next 10 minutes, but I invite you to, you know this audience really, really well. So speak from your heart as to whatever you think um, from your most recent experiences, potentially, um, uh, how you're seeing this manifest on campus and navigating this. So I will, um, I'm just going to think out loud with you because I don't profess to have any answers. Um, and, and I do like the idea of the self, the others, and the system, and so I'll frame my thoughts out loud in, the, in that sense. Um, personally, I really struggled when we first uh, became quarantined. And this notion that all problems are solvable did not feel that it applied in this situation. And, and as change leaders and change makers, we don't want to stop. We always want to find a way, but this felt too big and it felt too complex. 
And the numbers of people dying was just very painful. And so what I found at the self level is that I needed some space to allow my humanity to breathe as opposed to my change maker or change leader identity or any other identity to take up space. I needed Pascal to just experience this moment in its fullness um, to reconnect to a sense of purpose. And, and that started out at the self level um, when I realized I couldn't do it in my head. Um, <clears throat> I went on a vegetarian fast and then from there I started doing a lot more physical activity. I had way too much energy pent up. And then I reconnected to my meditation practice. And those three things allowed me to get stronger. Um, because my, my gravitation towards being emotional was diminishing my effectiveness in a sense. I couldn't think clearly. And so as an entry point into this conversation, I needed to give myself time and space and permission to just feel what was going on in a way that was authentic, authentic for me and that just made sense to me. Um, so that's my first entry point into the conversation. Once I was able to get some grounding in that sense, and, and meanwhile, I was still meeting with my team, and you know, I have a vertical team, a higher up team, and I also have a team below me, and I have a peer team. So I'm operating in the system at three different levels. I still needed to show up in those conversations, and meanwhile, I was hurting inside. And I needed to reconcile those two things because I could not lead from a position of clarity feeling as wounded as I did. And so when I was able to build my inner strength inside of this new situation, I recognized my assignment in this moment. And as somebody who is um, very committed to empathy and, um, and finding life in the other, my assignment was to listen in order to figure out my next step. I was not in a position to come up with the answer on my own. And so as part of that assignment, inside of a very large system, we're still in phase one on many campuses. Um, people's anxiety is really, really high. And in a higher ed context, where people have been tenured, it's their home in a place like Miami-Dade. People have been working there 20, 30 years. We have an aging population. We have a very Latin and Caribbean culture where people are taking care of family. Our faculty, staff, and administrators needed to be heard before we could even get to the students. And very often the focus is on the students and inequities, et cetera. What I came to learn is our people needed to be loved. And also people started to show up in their wholeness. So you've got people working from home with kids hanging off their neck, the dog is barking, they've got to cook. And it wasn't, it wasn't like the typical office where you could say, I need X, Y, and Z, or they could commit to something predictable. They were navigating their whole selves in a context that didn't give them permission to just focus on work. And so there was a degree of compassion that just needed to be present so that other people could express whatever was going on for them. And so what I found in moving from the self to the other is that we were no longer working in a higher ed institution. We were a community of people trying to survive. And that survival was essential because we still have on my campus 20,000 plus people who are assuming the trains are running on time. We've got our act together. Like we don't get to not be perfect for that population. And because we're such a mission driven place, everyone wanted to bring their A game so our students didn't stop on their journey because despite what was going on for our faculty, staff and administrators, we have students who were living in abusive situations, who were hungry, who were the providers for their homes and there was no more income coming in. I mean, that the layers started to pile on in many different respects. So you have these parallel things happening at the same time. And what we did at the college is where we could put a stopgap on an inequity being student facing, we did that in terms of distributing laptops, uh, giving distributing food from our food pantry. I mean, sort of those, those surface level solutions that are really important 
to keep people stable through the crisis. But what, we, what I learned is the team needed to come together in a new way. We almost had to reintroduce ourselves inside of the new realities we were working in and create space for us to work around those with kids, those dealing with aging parents, et cetera. The other thing is that for people who have very fragile homes in terms of faculty, staff, et cetera, they wanted to come to campus even though it wasn't safe. And what that told us is that not only are our students fragile, but so are our faculty, staff, and administrators. And so we've been in conversations to think through how are we going to build a sense of community that embraces the whole individual? Because this is not going to end before January. You know, the, the, this, this, we all thought it was going to be short term, especially in Florida. The numbers have been going up, up, and up. We've got to really start thinking about what does community look like in this context? And we're all Zoomed out. So it's not even like Zoom can be that mechanism. But what's going to be the bridge that's going to link us together? And that's the inquiry that we're in right now. So that's one thing I wanted to offer. You know, the other thing about being different, it's not fun. It, it really is not a place that you want to stand in without having a tribe like this to have your back. You know, most places, most higher ed places are not talking about the divine in others or you know, fasting and meditation, you might find some pockets in the community, but that's usually not the dominant narrative. You know, I'm a unicorn and, and I recognize that in the context where I am. And it's been very difficult to stand steady in that unicornness when people want to go in the traditional transactional route, that's not gonna work anymore because it's the known and it's safe. And to say, wait a minute, hold on a second. It's not a good feeling. It's not a good feeling. And, and when others doubt your capacity to lead because it's not operating in the traditional modality, it takes something to really pivot. And what I have found um, after many lumps, bumps, bruises, whatever you wanna call it, is that um, through my leadership, by activating others that speak the language that's familiar, it allows, it allows me to meet people where they are without it being me, if that makes sense. And so what I've had to learn in terms of building teams of teams is finding those people that I can activate in order for them to activate in a way that's comfortable because right now it's too threatening for people. There's too much change going on and anything that feels too radically different than what they're comfortable with it's too threatening and the resistance is immediate. So I'll give you a concrete example. One of the things we're looking at is how do we ensure our adult learners are able to enroll on campus? Because a lot of people losing their jobs are also the students who would have gone part-time. In our institution, we offer two years and four-year degrees. And so what we started to do, we had a conversation about that in an open-ended way and immediately people thought, we don't know which jobs are, are shutting down, the industries, we're not sure, some things might be opening, they, we're not, I mean, there's just too many variables. And it was overwhelming. And so another entry point, when I found a data person, we started to tease out, where did we get students last year? And where are those students now? And then we started to delve more deeply into very specific programs that were not attached to anything that was changing, but that was pretty steady. Then I allowed him to sell the idea of us pursuing a grant in order to enroll these learners. By removing myself from the equation, I'm too threatening because everyone sees me as change, change, change. But someone that represents the status quo that was able to speak the same message was heard very differently. And so I'm also recognizing in building this team of teams, finding the right mouthpiece to connect with the right audience. And that person also had credibility who was sensitive to the faculty and the staff in a different kind of way. And so all of that is to say, it's a work in progress with life on the court. We're trying not to lose sight of our students who unfortunately, when we go remote, they don't tend to perform as well. So there's an issue of retention and continuity that we just haven't been able to face as of yet. 
But the idea right now is where we can meet people in their wholeness, engage them to collaborate, and find solvable problems where we can win. We need to win right now in some small ways that will lead to big ways. But it's so important for people to feel their work matters, that things are progressing in a positive fashion and moving forward. Um, it, it's not going to be systems change with the big C, but it's going to be progress and it's going to be small changes. And when the appetite is ready, I think we can get to the systems change conversation. Pascal. You pack a punch, my goodness. Thank you so much for sharing so personally and so vulnerably about your, your experiences right now. Um, I was taking copious notes and here's my attempt at transferable insights or like your top seven tips from, uh, from Pascal. Tell me if this is, is close or not. One, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Um, two, uh, love others around you. Like really build that, that core of support and equip those who have got to be equipping other people. So be really mindful, not just about the end user or the end beneficiary or the end stakeholder or the student in our context, but also the team that's supporting them. Um, redefine the ways of organizing. We've been thrown into uh, uh, circumstances that, that we would use the word team of teams in the past, but even that and even you know, uh, physical interdisciplinary teams are being thrown out the window at this point. So what does it look like e even in a virtual context to redefine how we organize? Building community in this context, which I think is closely related to another one, which is like, don't stand alone. Um, I sense a theme of giving permission, not only giving permission to self to take care of yourself, but also that you don't have to be the different one all the time and you don't have to do it alone. But that's probably there's a time to take on and take off and to time to do that in community. Um, I can't read my notes on the next one, so we'll keep going. So maybe it's actually six and not seven. Um, finding, oh, finding the right mouthpiece, I think was another key point. So maybe you're not the right representative, but who can speak into this in a way that will be influential or well-received um, and finding small wins. Um, appreciating that system changes and ever-evolving process and we're not gonna master it in one stroke. Even though we talk about leverage points, which are important, um, there's not one leverage point that's gonna solve everything. Um, and so while those are good systems thinking skills, um, we're in it for the long haul of transformation. Hopefully that was, it was that close, Pascal. Awesome, awesome. We, um, we need to rapidly move. I want to really give some time, even though it's not much for breakouts for folks, but before I do so, as we kind of just wrap up the panel, um, two very practical questions. And so this is popcorn. This is like 30 second, one minute response because we're short on time. But I think a key question that resonates with a lot of folks and it's speaking to a couple of those last points, Pascal, is how do, how, how can change leaders where they're sitting right now influence others in this virtual world? So if influence is a key lever of systems leadership, systems change leadership, and we're not physically at the water cooler anymore, we're not passing each other in the halls, we're not in that weekly meeting, um, what are the ways of creating influence, even in the circumstances that we stand? Pascal, please. You know, I, I think it's, and in this moment, it's finding two or three people who are the right people for a very specific conversation. I think there's a degree of specificity that is helpful to go deeper in analyzing and thinking through a situation. You know, very often in a shared governance context, we tend to have way too many people in the conversation. And when we're physically present, we have the, we have the capacity to engage that. We don't have that in this space. And so I, I think of the focus piece will allow for certain kinds of conversations, but having the right people and keeping that number tight will be helpful. Super helpful. Thanks, Pascal. Valeria or Anita, anything else to add? Um, I, I want to offer number seven uh, from Pascal that blew my mind. It, it was actually your first one. When, when you said, uh, when you invited all of us to let our humanity to breathe, mm. um, I think that in the era of Zoom, uh, that's more important than ever. How to be authentic especially with the ones that we didn't know before. It's very easy in Zoom to connect with those that we already have a foundation of trust. It's extremely difficult with those that we don't. And what Pascal invited us to do is uh, 
I think is the essential ingredient to be authentic with ourselves, within ourselves, and also when we show up for others. Right. I would add, stop looking for those systems change leaders. Realize that you are maybe the system change leader. So um, just believe in that and then see what comes out of that. Mm. And maybe one last quick tip before we kind of move into breakouts. In normal times, busting silos is a challenge, right? Even when we're physically present and we have the chance to build the trust in relationships, I think that is proving to be even increasingly difficult um, in virtual spaces where um, time and limitation and we're moving at speed. Um, and yet we have this really ripe moment where things are being disrupted, where we're having to be innovative and where we're in a time calling for radical innovation for, um, for systems of equity. And so I'd be curious, what would you suggest in terms of like tips of breaking silos, um, whether that be in the, in the real world or whether that be in a virtual world, but that's a, a key issue for all of us. Dab at it. So one of the things that, that we did, I talked a little bit about this intersectionality network and it, it came out of the recognition that we have affinity groups that are still operating in silos and trying to leverage this moment with all the protests that we unpacked, the we being our leadership team. And so we redefined the space, which made the silo seem irrelevant, if that makes any sense. And so no longer are people just talking about Black Lives Matter or just talking about police reform or just talking about health inequities, but all of those are interlapping and in, interconnecting in the public space. And, and using that reality that's undeniable to reframe the work. And once we did that, I, I had a series of conversations with each leaders at the interpersonal level that allowed them, and I did it in, a, in a, a sort of a focus group format where I was pretending to ask them things that I thought they would answer differently, but I kind of knew what they would say, but they said it out loud and they said it to each other. And by reframing our work to be relevant, because the other piece in it was making it mission driven because everyone cares so much about the students and how could they be transfer ready, workforce ready or civically engaged if we were not having these conversations in this way. So that has proved to allow us, it's proven to allow us to be able to go past those silos by reframing the work in a way that's just simply undeniable. Actually, probably in all of my culture transformations over the last seven years that I've been working at McKinsey, breaking silos was one of the priorities. So it's, <laughs> it's everywhere. But to be honest, in the last three months of working virtually, silos have been broken at, at the speed I've never seen before without having you know, to do much. So I, I, I do see that uh, decision making has been uh, uh, you know, really s speeded up. I do see uh, uh, you know, through the, the Zoom or Teams or whatever, these connectivities, right? I think there is, uh, uh, it's much easier to reach out to people. I think there is a way of um, right now, you're not, you're not you, your world has changed, right? I think before you had kind of your, your rhythm, your folks, your, the people you ran into the doorways. Now you have the entire world actually at your fingertips, right? The, the number of lives and conferences and, and, and you know, even like us at McKinsey, we have 30,000 people. Now it's much easier to bring in an expert into conversation for a one hour call than before, right? Having to take a plane and so on. So I do, I do see an opportunity actually also through the virtual world to connect, you know, to different uh, environments, different topics, right? That you were maybe uh, not not being able to connect anymore. And I do see that actually uh, uh, the connection between people as we are, you know, it's, it's the first time, right? Probably since, since World War II, there's this common cause, right? So before you had to kind of find to, a, a topic to connect to the person, uh, you know, maybe movies or sports or something like that. So it was difficult to guess how can you connect. Now everybody has, you know, similar fears, similar difficulties. So it's much easier to break the ice and actually connect ourselves more with the human beings behind the position. So I think now is the moment to break silos for sure. Great. Valeria, any parting words? 
I, I echo uh, what Pascal and, and Anita said, and I would only add that we need to continue innovating on feedback loops in this new mode that we are. As in like, how do we create feedback loops that allow our, each one of us to better sense this uh, digital community of communities that we're in. Uh, and I think, I suspect, and I would like to think we are in the very early stages of that. And that by December, let's hope that we're gonna become uh, masters at it because it's, it's very easy in this world and this situation that we're facing to be in our own um, reality without necessarily uh, having a good sense, a grounded sense of uh, uh, perspective. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I think that's a beautiful way to kind of close this out. Like as we are thinking about what um, academic terms look like uh, in this next few months in this season, how are we designing our work to incorporate feedback loops and to be sensing feedback from the system that can help us to iterate. Um, and I think your point, Anita, as well about finding that shared cause um, and illuminating that is so important. I want to ask folks if you um, are interested to come back on video, we'd love to see your faces. I'd love for you to help me give just a warm, huge thank you and gratitude to our panelists, whether you wanna use the reaction with the clap function, if you wanna come on board, give us jazz hands that we would just appreciate. Um, that you guys would take time all the way from Massachusetts to Brazil to Miami um, and give us the, the pleasure of your lived experience, of your professional experience, of your passion and your values. Thank you so much. <laughs>